guys, welcome back. Today we're going to pick back up where we left off, talking about the Dark Elves. Hag, Graif, the Dark Crag. The Dark Crag is a sinister and foreboding place, built at the bottom of a cold, dark canyon and completely surrounded by mountains of bare rock that stretch into the clouds. It is a city permanently in shadow, for no sunlight ever reaches its walls. Hag Grief is a place of twisted and impossible architecture. Its eight black towers rise from the canyon floor like the ossified remains of some loathsome cephalopod. Between the towers are strong walkways, platforms, and bridges of every conceivable shape and size. Some are fashioned from withered timber and soot-stained bone. Others are crafted from jagged stone or woven from the silk of monstrous spiders. The larger platforms are so massive as to be towns and villages in their own right, and are supported by gantry works of iron and stone. It is upon these that the majority of Hagrief's citizenry dwell, crammed into crooked mansions of cinder brick and fire-blackened wood. The towers are home only to the city's most powerful dreadlords. Cramped conditions, combined with the Dark Elves' peremptory nature, ensure that rivalries flare into violence with alarming regularity. Those who do not walk cautiously through Hag Grief's webwork of streets have their throats slit and bodies heaved into the morass of sewage and rotting flesh that covers the canyon floor. The rocks below Hag Grief are honeycombed with mines and quarries that are, in turn, threaded through with chain gangs of slaves who claw iron and jet black stone from the belly of the world. This is the most miserable of existences, toiling far from any natural light, starved of all but the meanest food, and chilled to the bone by the piercing wind that howls through the tunnels. Even after death there is no respite. The mines are riddled with veins of warp stone, whose baleful power animates the dead and keeps them laboring until they collapse into piles of worn bones. Driven by the wealth of its mines, Hag Grief has risen to become Nagaroth's second city. In fact, it is so prosperous that its armies and influence overshadow even those of Nagarond. So eager are Hag Grief's people to escape their abysmal home that the forced conscription present in other cities is completely unnecessary here. Indeed, over the centuries, Hag Grief has earned a reputation for producing, if not the most disciplined fighters, then certainly the most desperate. The city's mercenary rulers, ever eager for profit, have taken to selling warriors into service elsewhere in Nagaroth, taking with it the opportunity to infiltrate spies. So rich is Hag Grief in soldiery, slave, and coin, that were its eight great families every tr ever truly united in purpose, they could doubtless overthrow the Witch King. Naturally, Malekith is aware of this, and spares no effort in keeping the Dark Crag's nobles at one another's throats. He need scarcely bother with so much wealth at stake, 
intrigue, and betrayal are already rife. Hag Grief's greatest prize is the position of First Dreadlord. He who holds this title is the nominal ruler of the city and all its domains. The First Dreadlord sets the tariffs that govern the city's trade and is in an excellent position to take a cut of all merchantry. With this wealth comes a life of patronage and grand opulence beyond the dreams of other elves, but few incumbents survive long in office. Indeed, many of Hag Grief's social elite consider the lavish ceremony of ascension to be little more than the official opening of a new round in a particularly deadly game. None of this deters the city's nobles from competing for the first dreadlord's chains of office. Arrogance is as rife here as it is in any other quarter of Nagaroth, and no dark elf believes himself foolish enough to end his rule shot, stabbed, poisoned, garroted, or beheaded. He cannot be persuaded of the danger, even though these things have happened to previous rulers more times than can be counted. Life is scarcely less competitive elsewhere in Hag Grief. The eight families constantly vie with one another for the first Dreadlord's favor, even as they plot to have him violently removed from office. Even family ties do not guarantee loyalty. Many a brother or daughter has risen to new heights over the corpses of their siblings, thanks to the timely use of poison, or by pressing enough gold into an assassin's hand. It should, therefore, not be surprising that Canite assassin cults flourish nowhere in Nagaroth so well as they do in Hag Grief, where there are always dreadlords seeking to remove rivals or in need of protection from the machinations of their enemies or their friends. Even so, there are insufficient hired blades to meet the incredible demand, and an assassin might well answer to a hundred different masters over the course of a year. Under such circumstances, discretion and silence have become traits valued as highly as more traditional skills. As a result, many assassins sew their mouths closed, sever their own vocal cords, or nail their jaws shut to ensure they are no longer physically capable of revealing an employer's identity. Clar Carond, Tower of Doom. Clar Carond serves as the Witch King's chief shipyard, for it is here that the keels are laid for many thousands of raiding vessels. This is a more sprawling city than others in Nagaroth, stretching from the banks of the Red Venom River up into the trackless pine forest of the Dusk Ridge. It is from these ancient woodlands that the Dark Elves harvest the black timber from which they build their sleek hulled warships. The Nagarothi do not perform this work themselves, of course, for such labors are considered well beneath them, but instead set thousands of slaves to the task. As the woodlands recede, their hearts torn out by hooked chains or consumed by dark fire. The ever-expanding streets of Clark Rond have spilled into the gap. Year by year, the city swells further, having grown fat on the labors of its slaves and desolation of the surrounding land. Once there was but one great tower looking over the Red Venom River. Now the dusk
musk ridge bristles with jagged minarets. With each wave of expansion, new ramparts have been raised not only to protect the city as a whole, but also to defend each tower from its neighbors. As a result, Clark Arond's streets are tangled and maze-like, marred by half-collapsed buildings, severed concourses, and entire districts buried forever as new and more impressive fortifications are raised. Clark Arond is also famed for its beastmasters. It was here, many centuries ago, that the Knights of Hag Grief brought the first gold wands to be broken, and much later that the ferocious Charybdis of the Deeps were bent to the Dark Elf's will. Now Manticore pens, harpy cages, and other enclosures are common in Clark Arond, as the temples of Cain, as common as. Both are outnumbered by the belt-draped shrines of Anath Rama, for the goddess of the savage hunt has ever been the patron of beast masters. Thus, when the armies of Clark Arond go to war, they do so in Anath Rama's name, driving her savage children before them to break the enemy lines with tooth and claw. Names of Power Family ties are seldom flaunted in Nagaroth. For a dark elf to achieve true renown, he must do so through his own actions, not through the long-ago deeds of some withered sire. For this reason, dark elves betray their lineage in name or title. Excuse me. Few dark elves betray their lineage in name or title, but instead adopt warrior names, chosen to strike fear into the hearts of their allies and enemies. Such titles must be backed up by deeds if they are to have any chance of gaining acceptance and renown. So it is common for dark elf lordlings to adopt names that reflect their vile proclivities, or that can at least be proven by fearsome acts. A Nagarothi who assumes the warrior name Venom Blade had best go to battle with his weapons coated in the deadliest of poisons, lest he suffer mockery, and likely a poisoned death at the hands of his peers. Similarly, a noble who takes the name Sever Spine will go to almost theatrical lengths to remind other dark elves of its appropriateness. Curiously, some of these warrior names have now become so renowned that they are handed down in exactly the same way as the family names that have all been all but abandoned. Thus have the sons of five generations borne the fell heart name, and thus has a warrior named Chillblade served at Malekith's right hand since his ascension, even though no elf of that name has lived longer than a hundred years. The dark elves see nothing contradictory in this behavior. For while a family name is granted merely for having been born, a warrior name will only be ceded to a progeny who has performed the deeds to deserve it. As such, the latter will always be worth more than the former, even if both are handed down through the blood. The Underworld Sea for hundreds of years, the Dark Elf raiding fleets were confined to the Sea of Chaos and the Great Ocean. They then discovered the Underworld Sea, 
a huge underground water system that linked the Sea of Chaos to Nagaroth's western coast. The Underworld Sea is a treacherous place, consisting of labyrinthine mazes of dark tunnels and strange caves. Movement is dangerous even on the well-known routes, for cave-ins and flash floods are a constant danger. There are also many strange and cruelly predatory creatures that inhabit this unearthly subterranean realm, and their eyes are far more accustomed to the gloom than those of the dark elves on whom they prey. The most accomplished explorers of the underworld sea come from the Shade tribes, mountain dwellers who forsook the life of the bleak cities in ages past. Yet even they have only uncovered a small fraction of the underworld sea's secrets. Each decade brings new discoveries, and rumors abound of an entire lost civilization hidden deep within the underground caverns. Har Kaldra, the Forgotten City Har Kaldra was once a mighty fortress that dominated the landward passes between Nagarond and the Iron Frost Glacier. Now it is a scarred and ruined crater, surrounded by the outflung remnants of its own walls, a testament to Malekith's fickle rage. It was the Witch King that wrought Har Kaldra's ruin meeting the rebellion within its walls with all the sorcerous might at his command. Thousands perished in that one night of horror and fury, and thousands more were taken bondage to Nagarond, there to die in its fire pits and gladiatorial arenas. The Watchtowers Nagaroth is a land in little danger of invasion. Few enemy fleets survive more than a few hours in its corsair-infested waters, let alone long enough to close with the jagged coast and land troops. The only real dangers come from the Lustrian legions to the south and the hordes of chaos that roam the frozen wastelands to the north. The Dark Elves consider that they need no def fixed defenses against the former, for the Lizardmen stir themselves to meaningful assault, but infrequently. The latter, however, have proven so undeterred by their appalling losses and ignominious defeats that the Nagarothi have founded many great citadels to hold the hordes of Northmen at bay. Each of these watchtowers is the size of a city, provisioned to withstand years of siege, and garrisoned with a great host of Nagaroth's foremost warriors. Thus have threats from the realm of chaos been held at bay, at least for now.
but only when it amuses him to do so. Only Marathi's sibilant voice does he heed, and then always with an ear alert to deception. Even the eldest of his other courtiers has strode the world for but a fraction of Malekith's existence, and the witch king hangs upon their words no more than he would consider the counsel of a clever child. So long has Malekith lived, and so generous has he been with his blood, that few of Nagaroth's nobles do not claim descent from his line. At Malekith's command, the Dark Elves have brought war to aided Ulthuan many times. Their goal, to claim by arms the birthright that was denied to them. Time and again, the Witch King's armies bring ruin beyond imagination upon their hated foes, only to be cast back across the western ocean through the vicissitudes of fate. I don't think I've ever heard that word before. To a mortal ruler, even one such defeat would be a tragedy, the undoing of a lifetime's work. For Malekith, who long ago achieved immortality, they are but setbacks that create fresh opportunities. When brute force failed, the witch king sent infiltrators and assassins to undermine Ulthuan from within. When subversion did not yield lasting results, Malekith reached out to other realms, bribing their armies to make war in his cause. To date, Ulthuan has endured every attack, but has each time paid for its survival with slaughtered warriors and ravaged kingdoms. Yet it will not be able to do so forever. The fires of war have left Ulthuan scarred, serve. Excuse me. The fires of war that have left Ulthuan scarred serve only to temper the Witch King into ever more powerful forms. From every defeat, Malekith emerges stronger than before, and ever more determined to triumph. Where the High Elves despair for each of their warriors that falls, the Witch King spends the lives of his followers without care for their survival. They are the weapons of his vengeance, nothing more. Soon there will come a time when the High Elves cannot meet the blood price that Malekith's hatred demands. On that day, the Witch King will finally know lasting victory, and the High Elves will be obliterated once and for all. The Dark Epoch. Having known only the guidance of Malekith's firm hand, the Dark Elves cannot reckon time according to the rule of kings, as is the custom with the High Elves. Rather, they record the great epochs of the Witch King's rule, ages of the world that turn on deeds of fire and slaughter. Only the first of these epochs, the Age of Glory, tallies exactly with the rule of a phoenix king. Anarion was father to both the children of Ulthuan and Nagaroth, Nagaroth and is revered as such in both lands. Other ages might end in conjunction with the close of a phoenix king's reign, but only in order to celebrate his death. The Dark Elf calendar contains four seasons, though they are not founded in changeable weather. Bleak Nagaroth is ever cold and racked with storms, no matter the time of year. Dark Elves therefore de dedicate the seasons, blood, 
despair, decadence, and savagery to their four most worshipped deities, respectively Cain, Ereth, Kyle, Arathi, and Anath Rama. In Nagaroth, dates are therefore recorded by age, then year, then season, and finally the day, though the latter two are seldom used in regard to momentous occasions. The Age of Endless Glory 1 to 80 Imperial Calendar circa minus 4500 to minus 4419 The elves were once but a single race that lived in peace and contentment amidst the paradise of Ulthuan. Alas, nothing endures forever and this proved true of that golden age. When the great star gates of the Old Ones collapsed, a cataclysmic rent was torn in reality that allowed a tide of demons to sweep across the globe, leaving slaughter and destruction in their wake. The elves were defenseless against this onslaught, untouched as they were by the depravities of war. Yet from the blood and slaughter emerged the greatest elf hero to have ever walked the world, an Aryan. In him the mightiest warrior spirit was kindled, and it was he who rallied the elves and taught them the ways of war. Though an Aryan and his growing band of warriors fought ceaselessly and without fear, the demon horde was unending. In desperation, Anarion went to the sacred fire of Assyrian, lord of all the elven gods, and offered himself as the ultimate sacrifice. With prayers upon his lips, Anarion hurled himself into the white-hot flames. Though the mystical fires burned his body and seared his soul, Anarion refused to surrender. Through strength of will he endured the punishment of the cleansing fires. Purified by his ordeal, a light shone from within Anarion, a glow of power that filled elves with courage and caused demons to cower in his presence. Soon he was hailed as the Phoenix King, the reborn son of Assyrian. As Anarion's army swelled, the tide of war changed in the elves' favor. It was at this time that Anarion met with the first of the dragon tamers, the powerful mage Kalidor. The two saw the strength that existed in each other and shared a common purpose. Kalidor recognized the sacred blessing bestowed upon an Aryan, and swore fealty to the Phoenix King. Yet for all the strength of the united elven host, it remained insufficient to, demeet, <laughs> to defeat the demonic legions. Thus did Kalidor devise a bold plan to rid the world of chaos forever. The dragon tamer and his mages would create a vortex to siphon away the magical power of the demons and return it to the realm of chaos. Anarion cursed Kalidor for a fool, deeming such a tactic to be the most desperate folly. The Doom of Cain Anarion then heard news that was to quench the fire of his heart and turn it into a chill hatred. His wife, the Everqueen Astariel, was slain and his children were missing. In a cold rage, Anarion swore that he would destroy every demon in existence in vengeance for this act. 
Though calmer minds counseled otherwise, Anarian traveled to the blighted isle, and beheld the shrine of Cain, the elves' bloody god of murder. Jutting from the black altar stood the widow-maker, the accursed weapon of the lord of murder. The moment Anarian drew the weapon, he invited Cain into his heart and soul, and thus doomed himself and his entire line. Armed with the weapon of the war god, and riding the great dragon in Draugnir, the unstoppable Anarian slaughtered demons in their thousands. Little by little, the hordes of chaos were forced from Ulthuan, and, for a while, a shifting and fragile peace descended. Anarian now championed the cause of those elves who had suffered most during the war, for their sorrow reflected his own. They gathered to the Phoenix King's side and repaid him with an unassailable loyalty. Anarian soon came to trust these new followers more than his allies of old, and, with their aid, founded a new kingdom in bleak Nagareth. It was fitting, Anarian said, that a king should rule from a land that matched his mood. Where other elves fought to survive, Anarian's warriors fought for the joy of fighting and slew for slaying's sake. They sneered at the weakness they saw abound in other lands, and swore never to stoop so low themselves. In time, Anarian took another wife, the beautiful Seeress Marathi, whom he had rescued from the predations of a Slaneshi host. Many were surprised at his choice, for Marathi was as different from Astariel as night is from day, but, by now, the Phoenix King had become so grim of outlook that few dared question him on any decision, let alone upon one so personal. To those that did inquire, Anarian said simply that he had chosen a consort suited to the times at hand, and would be drawn no further on the matter. Whilst it was plain to all that Marathi deeply loved Anarian, none could ever be certain that he returned her affections. By that point the Phoenix King rarely seemed to embrace any emotion that was grounded in aught other than anger or despair. Conversely, it was utterly apparent that Anarian had come to rely on Marathi's counsel, almost to the exclusion of all others. With each year that passed, her influence became ever more evident in every decision he made. The elves of other lands looked upon this development with increasing levels of concern, but the folk of Nagareth cared not for they loved Marathi almost as dearly as they did their king. In time, Marathi bore an Aryan a fine son and heir, whom they named Malakith. The young prince had inherited all the many gifts of his parents, and under their tutelage became not only an accomplished warrior and skilled mage, but also a leader of great quality. The court of Anarian had become a wild place, full of savage gaiety and bitter mirth. By then, few in Nagareth believed it was even possible to win a lasting victory against the demons, so they took what joy they could in every moment. Not every outlet of their indulgence was entirely wholesome, however. Hunting, dueling, and other blood sports became increasingly common, and rumors abound of sacrifices to forbidden gods. War and death had become the twin obsessions of Anarian's court, and many of his oldest friends, Kalidor amongst them, 
could bear it no longer, and departed to found a kingdom in the southern mountains. Calidor's betrayal angered an Arian greatly, and for a time many feared that Ulthuan would war amongst itself. And perhaps it would have done, had the demons not come once again, in numbers that far overshadowed any previous assault. The Great Ritual The war between the elves and demons then reached its final stage. Touched by a Surian and marked by Cain, Anarian was all but invincible, but he could not be everywhere. Ulthuan stood on the brink of destruction, and would surely have fallen had it not been for Kalidor. When the ancient mage beheld the demon's renewed onslaught, he deemed it beyond the power of the elves to contain. Thus he sent no forces to aid Anarion's counterattack, instead gathering his followers at the Isle of the Dead to begin the desperate ritual to drain the demon's magical lifeblood from the world. When Anarion learned of this, he was torn. Calidor had betrayed him a second time, but in doing so it created a slim chance of victory. Pride and duty fought in Anarion's soul. Pride urged him to leave Calidor to his fate, to fight on heedless of consequence. Ultimately, the Phoenix King found he could not set his duty aside. Marshalling his followers one last time, Anarion bade them ride to Calidor's aid. Marathi, fearful of losing her king, pleaded with Anarion not to go. She begged him to stay, promising a life together through all the ages of the world. But in this one matter, Anarion heeded her not. Climbing wearily onto Indraugnir's back, he left his weeping wife behind and rode to meet his destiny. What followed was a battle that shook the world, as Kalidor's mages be began their great work. The host of Nagareth hurled itself at the demon horde with a fury born of desperation. Under wailing skies racked with fire and lightning, they held the line in Anarion's name. That day, elves fought like gods reborn, and their phoenix king battled with a might to which mere words could never do justice. As the ritual reached its peak, four greater demons combined their power to assail Kalidor's wards. Only Anarion and Indraugnir were close enough to stop them. They did not hesitate, but charged into the fray. Now, at last, the Phoenix King met his match. Though the ensuing battle saw four ruinous beasts defeated, victory left Anarion and Indraugnir mortally wounded. Weary beyond words, the Phoenix King sank to his knees. Sensing victory, the demons howled with one terrible voice. But then, Kalidor completed his ritual, and their dark laughter was stilled. With a burst of energy that shook the mountains, the great vortex sprang into life. A whirling, screaming tempest of magic engulfed Ulthuan, slaying thousands and shattering forever those fortresses whose walls still stood. Trapped within the eye of the vortex stood Kalidor and his mages, frozen in eternal battle against the forces they sought to contain. The exhausted Anarian clambered atop in Draugnir, who, with the last of his strength, brought the Phoenix King once more to the Shrine of Cain. Anarian's final act was to return the Widowmaker to its home. 
he was never again seen by mortal eyes. Ulthuan lay in ruins, but as the great vortex drew away much of the magic corrupting the world, the demons vanished back to their unholy realm. The elves thanked the gods, praised an Arian, and set about creating a realm of light and warmth to drive away the evils of the recent past. But labor though they might, the elves would never regain the golden age of yore. In drawing the infamous Widowmaker, an Arian had set in motion events that would lead to the sundering of the people he had striven to protect. And with that, we are going to bring this video to a close. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, I will let you know, coming down the pipe, we are going to finish Dark Elves, and we are going to finish with the Space Marines, and then, by request, we are going to do Death Core of Grieg. Um, so, look forward to that stuff, and I will see you guys later. Bye-bye.